welcome everybody. Good midday, afternoon, depending on when you woke up at our Fortinet Cybersecurity Roadshow, the virtual version. Okay, so quickly some introductions. Who is going to be presenting today? So we have a guest speaker from Fortinet, of course, Lars Putenier, system engineer. And from Exclusive Networks, we have myself, pre-sales engineer, Pietri Blaton, Stan Van Hoof, also pre-sales engineer, and then our business development manager, Karen Hook. Um, so yeah, there is a disclaimer about possible bad language. Uh, that might happen um, when the demo, uh, the live demo is going to fail. We'll see. So the, on the agenda, what do we have today? Uh, we will start with a, a brief overview of the threat landscape. We will review 2019, pinpoint some trends, um, and we will be talking about a few things that already happened in 2020. There's two top challenges we have selected of we, we, have, uh, we have seen uh, in the market, that is cloud and ransomware. Then Stan will present a teaser about um, yeah you will see it's a teaser and then Lars is going to present you the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain and the Fortinet way of intuitive protection how Fortinet can um, yeah work on that cyber kill chain what kind of products etc and then it, we have some time for a demo the Fortinet security fabric but not from the perspective of the FortiGate we will zoom in uh, on the perspective of the home user. So how to secure that home office? What do you need and what do you already have? And then, then we have some time for questions and answers and some feedback. Well, let's get started. Um, so this first slide is, um, you, you see it on the top left. Yeah, of course, it's from a, it's a document. Uh, Exclusive Networks has created together with Merluno. It's a consultancy firm. And what did we do? We did um, over 50 hours of interviews with more than 90 organizations in the top 50 Belgium companies. And we've been talking with CEOs, CISOs, and people that in general can take decisions on IT budget and are, are working on security. Um, so the, the, the IT, size, uh, IT department uh, or the, the size of the companies was from five users to 2,000 users. Uh, the verticals is in industry, service, logistics, health, government, retail, finance. So we, we took a, a very broad image of the, the cyber landscape in Belgium and we asked them questions about security, how they handle security, what they are looking for in the future, uh, what are uh, current projects they're having and whether they have suffered a security breach in 2019, yes or no. And the, the answer on that was astonishing. 82% of these organizations, they suffered a security breach. Now, we need to note there that a breach in security doesn't necessarily um, mean that the data actually got stolen, okay? It can be uh, a fault in a configuration which got detected where yeah, data was publicly accessible uh, on the internet. It doesn't mean that it has actually been accessed and stolen, but this figure is, is huge, okay? And then we saw uh, from these reviews that users remain the weakest link and that that is definitely something the companies are going to be investing in. So what have we already invested in? Uh, in firewalls, endpoint security, web security. So a lot of yeah, switching and routing, all of that has been huge investments over the the, the last years, but what do these companies lack in general? That is the integration of these technologies. Um, and integration of technologies, that means that, that the organizations, they need a single pane uh, of glass yeah, management, but especially also visibility. They wanna see uh, what is happening in their organization uh, only on, uh, yeah, from, one, uh, from one pane of glass. Another thing they're lacking is user awareness. So, and we see that in the top three investments, so the short-term investments, we see these companies, they, 24% of them, they wanna, uh, yeah, of their budget is going to security awareness, network and access control, and identity and access management. So a lot of that has to do with how users get access to the network, uh, zero trust security, 
these kinds of things. That's on the short term. And then long term trends, that is all pointing to uh, what has to do with cloud. Uh, organizations want to move to the cloud. Probably they've already partially moved to the cloud. But then in the coming 36 months, a lot of these organizations are going to, are looking to, to extend that uh, utilization in the cloud. Now, the second question there is what about security? And how are they going to handle that? The third pillar there is as well IoT and OT security. If you want to have the full report with more details on where these figures came from and how the uh, what kind of questions were asked, uh, you can actually scan this you uh, this code and download the uh, report. Okay. So what else? Um, a very important question is uh, yeah, to, to compare year over year is how good are organizations in detecting um, that they've been breached, okay? Or that there have been attempts being breached. And we can measure that in terms of the, the, the dwell time. So what is a dwell time? That's the amount of, and we, we calculate it in days, that's the amount of days that attackers had access to uh, an organization's uh, network, okay? Um, if we look at the figures, it, when we started measuring in 2011, this was over 400 days, so that was really bad. Um, we didn't make a distinction in how uh, it got detected from internal detection capabilities or external notifications by, by law enforcement, for example. Uh, starting in 2015, we, we started to make a difference. And now in 2019, we see that uh, the average dwell time globally is 56 days. So that is, that's a very, very good uh, evolution. Um, so we see that 41% as a detection rate lower than 30 days, uh, a dwell time of lower than 30 days. But there's still a lot of work to do for certain companies. 12%, there is still over 700 days. So that is that is crazy. That's more than, yeah, almost more than two years that these attackers have been in the organization's network. Imagine what they can do in that amount of time. Basically, they own the, the organization. Um, now, there are a few reasons why the figures are yeah, going in a, in a positive way, why they're going down. Um, yeah better tooling of course but also due to the uh, change in in the way organizations get get compromised when we're talking about rams ransomware and crypto miners these kinds of attacks they get notified immediately so a company is, is encrypted completely and in their face they get uh, get a warning hey you've been you've been hacked everything is uh, encrypted and yeah, please pay X amount of Bitcoins uh, before you get your data back. Uh, and that also helps in yeah, the, the dwell time, in, uh, in the detection rate, of course. So if we look at the EMEA median dwell time, um, uh, okay, there was an uh, EMEA figure. Um, so 54, something, 54 days. Uh, but if we look at the difference between external detection and internal internal detection, that's also uh, interesting. So here you can actually see that when an external party needs to notify the organization that they've been breached, in general, yeah, average speaking, the uh, the attackers are 300 days inside of the company. But if you have proper tooling, you can reduce that number, or on average, that number is reduced to 23 days. That's a huge, uh, huge difference. And then other questions, who is targeted? Okay. Um, and then there, yeah, there ra we raise a few questions. Who is behind the attacks? Uh, of, of course, outsiders, but there are also internal actors. We're not saying here that the, the people within the organizations are, are that 34% are, are actually trying to hack your, uh, your company. No, uh, we also include in these figures the configurations mistakes that are being made by these people that yeah, opens, for example, RDP access to the internet and that the company is breached in that way or that um, 
the data buckets on, in, the, in the cloud are just accessible for anyone. We also include that that are actually internal actors that are configuration mistakes uh, that are being made. And of course, also espionage, that's a small portion of that. Um, and then what actions are being used? How are the organizations being uh, attacked? What, and there we have different categories. Of course, 52% of breaches, they featured hacking meaning we're going to abuse an application or use an exploit to get in, inside of the organization or to move lateral. Uh, but interestingly, there is that 33% of these attacks include social attacks. And usually these social attacks, that is to get the initial um, yeah, foothold within the organization. Okay, we're sending a phishing email. Uh, we're trying to do credential uh, theft. and at that moment, we have we have credentials to, for example, log on to the mail uh, servers, and from there we are going to be sending emails uh, internally in the organization with other links or documents that include malware, and we can start hacking uh, hacking from there. Okay. Um, so who are the the breach victims? You know, many organizations they think, well, I'm not I'm a small company. Um, the product time I'm, I'm selling. It's it's pretty boring, whatever. Nobody's going to be interested in that. Well, as long as you're making money, these attackers are interested in you, okay? They will breach your organization, they will ransomware you, and you will have to pay, or yeah, nobody can work anymore. It's as simple as that. So we also see that, yeah, small business victims, they also exist. Everybody can be a victim. So I didn't say that small businesses are boring businesses, okay? Two trends, we have cloud, uh, that cloud trend and ransomware trend. Let's zoom into that cloud. A lot of companies are now making the transition to cloud and very often their first steps are just yeah, moving the email, okay? And then, and then the next idea is to also start moving all of the data in the cloud and making it accessible uh, from everywhere. And very often they make configuration mistakes in that and they actually accidentally make all that data available to the world. Now, that is a problem, of course. Or accidentally, they, they just give remote desktop protocol access to the world instead of only um, for the IT administrators. Or they forget to properly secure their API, um, et cetera, et cetera. So although there's a lot of incidents we've seen happening in the cloud, it doesn't mean that that the cloud uh, at its base is insecure. We still need credentials to log on to the cloud. So if there's credential theft, attackers are going to be able to log on to your cloud uh, resources and steal data. Um, and of course, yeah, co the configuring stuff in the cloud is is a lot different than what we are used to with with our perimeter security and our perimeter network or, or, or or uh, local networks. So configuration errors are, are big issues in the cloud as well. So we need, in order to solve that, we need to have visibility inside the cloud. So how can we do that? Connecting through cloud APIs um, and continuously uh, metering what is being configured and validating whether the configuration is best practice and secure or not. So bottom line, these hybrid deployments, they cause more complicated architectures, meaning that the attackers get more attack surface. And it is that at attack surface we need to protect better. In this case, yeah, cloud. If you don't know how it works, cloud, learn about that and then learn how to secure it. Here is the example of, of RDP. If you go to the website, show them, and you look for, uh, there you can look for anything which is any service which is open uh, to the internet, you can search for that. And if we look then for RDP, an interesting fact there on, on the left, uh, bottom left, you see Google Cloud, uh, Transcend Cloud Computing, Microsoft Azure, Amazon.com. Uh, it are not servers or systems from these organizations that are open to the cloud. It's not that Google is doing a bad job. No, it's the infrastructure that Google is offering as a server to customers in their cloud platform. Um, 
and the customers need to configure how to gain access to that, they accidentally opened uh, RDP access to their servers, which is a very bad thing. Because if we look at the next slide, Bluekeep, for example, that's a vulnerability who is, going, who is taking advantage of older Windows systems um, that had a critical vulnerability that needed to be patched early 2019. So if you have a server in the cloud on this version with RDP open to the world and it's unpatched, that's just, it's very easy. And we, we see that out in the wild, 800,000 public servers are vulnerable for this. And a bunch of those public servers, they're running in the cloud with probably, uh, yeah, with, with the RDP access open. So when this, um, how did this happen, Blue Keep? Uh, look at that. Um, Blue Keep was, yeah, there was a patch released for Blue Keep uh, in May, uh, uh, 14 of May in 2019. But what is more interesting to look at there, the moment the patch is released, we see that 30 days later, there are already exploits available that can be used uh, in exploits kits. Okay, and then it takes only a few more weeks before there is actually malware that is going to abuse this uh, and yeah, make it available on the a, on, on, on a black market for use. Uh, it's very, very similar to the eternal blue timeline. We had the same issue there in 2017. There was a, a Microsoft patch released, uh, 30 days later there is an exploit, and then it was used in a WannaCry attack and an Opetti attack. Now there was a big difference between Eternal Blue and Blue Keep, uh, in that way that yeah, Eternal Blue has been used by a worm. And a worm is a malware that is yeah, self-reproducing and will jump from one system to another easily. Now, we cannot do the same with Bluekeep. Why? Because Eternal Blue was focusing on the SMB protocol. Um, by default, all Windows systems have SMB enabled on them. So if you don't close it, basically clients and, and our servers, they are vulnerable. The, uh, the vulnerability code was also much more stable, meaning it didn't crash the machine when you when you exploited it and that is different with blue keep blue keep is on rdp rdp only probably that that are that is stuff which is only or mostly enabled on servers um and the attack is not that stable so it's it's not warmable but it's uh, it is being used and we will we will zoom in on that later so blue keep is definitely a bad thing here you see that it's being used in, the, uh, in an exploit kit. Meter Preter. So, all that. you see it was released in May 2019 and yeah, Microsoft is still posting about it in, uh, you see there the article November 7, 2019, that it is still seeing a lot of systems which are on the internet unpatched and it is, it is really an, a critical thing to do because blue keep attacks happen. Okay, not that frequent as we saw with Eternal Blue, but very um, yeah, organized. Okay, so you think moving to the cloud will fix everything? No, we've seen that and configuration mistakes make that yeah, accidentally RDP can be opened and with blue keep, et cetera, et cetera. So, some evolutions, thing we've, things we've seen the last few months in Belgium. Uh, ASCO has been, has been hacked last year. Um, thousand employees couldn't work for a month anymore. Um, it's probably going to cost the organization around one, 134 million. Uh, Norsk in Norway, um, 40 million in losses. Uh, all sites were hacked, 35,000 employees needed to be using pen and paper. So that is, that is really crazy, okay? Uh, imagine that happens to your organization or the customer's organization. Uh, chances are very high that they, that they go bankrupt. Not everybody can survive these kinds of things. And the, 
what is different in these kinds of ransomware attacks as the ones we've seen the years before in 2017 and 2018 is that the ransomware attacks are getting more and more targeted okay so they pick a company they start investigating on the company they they try to get inside you're probably using a phishing email stealing credentials sending attachment with with malware or trojans in there and once they get a foothold on the on a, on a patient zero one system in, in the organization they try to move uh, lateral and the moment they own all yeah, all the credentials and have all the tooling in place to do that lateral movement of the uh, of the ransomware attack they will they will encrypt the whole organization in uh, in one night in a few hours okay and that is what is what has happened to the examples above asco norsk another example is picanol uh, this was not not just uh, a warm um, ransomware no this was really targeted organized ransomware attack um, you can see if you have opened uh, one server to the internet which has the blue keep vulnerability that's the only entry point the attacker needs the moment they get on that system using blue keep they have system privileges and they have everything they need to move laterally as silent as possible and after a few weeks they will just uh, encrypt the whole organization very 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 dangerous um, the main vectors that are still being used is email um, and as yeah as we've seen also remote desktop protocol um, universe University of Ants, uh, Antwerp is also uh, an example there. If, if you read this document, okay, they were attacked uh, with ransomware, but then you see that the, the mail, uh, the whole mail server system uh, is affected, the whole multimedia platform. And very often people forget that uh, they think, okay, it's ransomware, everything is encrypted. If we decrypt it, it's solved. Uh, probably not, okay. Um, with these targeted attacks, the attackers, they gained access to your organization's network and they, they just chose to do one of the actions like, yeah, encrypting everything. But the chances are very high that they still have, um, that they still have uh, listeners or, or yeah, whatever on, on, on the systems that are maybe stealing credentials for future use, okay? So, Usually it's not only ransomware, but it's a combination of, of everything. Uh, it's a very big problem with these targeted attacks. Maastricht University is another example where uh, Stan will zoom in uh, a little bit later. We can all targeted. Why? Here you see the example. Why, why is it targeted? Uh, the Horizon company has been hacked. Um, even the um, the file names they include that that organization's uh, name. So this is this is not a this is not an attack that has been generalized and sent to the world. No, it's really focused on this organization. So our only yeah, and you, uh, what kind of organizations are being targeted? They're basically any organizations. Um, managed security service providers, cloud providers, they're also being targeted. Um, for example, here we have Everis, a large Spanish MSSP. Emotet Trojan was being sent over email, um, infecting one device. On that one device, an Empire toolkit was installed, uh, giving the opportunity for the hackers to do lateral movement to all of, of the devices, and then BitPamer uh, was being used to, yeah, to ransomware, basically. Uh, the whole organization um, and very often the response on that is panic and they need to pay a ransom of 750k uh, euros okay so we see everybody's target enterprises vendors mssps some examples you see here in the slides uh, spain um, healthcare russian hackers they claim to have breached major anti-malware vendors so yeah how big is the threat? Go figure. Uh, Imperva has been uh, has, has had a data breach. Uh, tech data has leaked a lot of private data. Pemex, a big petroleum organization in Mexico. Yeah, and 
what is a what is one of the biggest problems we've been seeing and yeah how did most of these attackers gain access to the organization's resources because of the human aspect okay spear phishing is by far the most popular uh, entry point the attackers will get into your organization people just want to click everything uh, they will try to open any document uh, execute installers whatever you ask them and that's a that's a, a big thing and we yeah this is often referred to social engineering now not all of this is the fault of the employee because honestly um, some emails you see they look really really legit the attackers are going to spoof identities they will present themselves as an employee of a certain organization um, they will create a certain sense of, of urgency like if you don't pay this there will be a fine um, they will look up information about the organization so if you're merging with somebody else or if you're going to acquire another organization they're going to use all of these details to make yeah, the communication look as legit as possible create that sense of urgency and then try for example to have you wire transfer some money okay these things happen in, in, in real life. Um, what can we do against spear phishing? Well, if for spear phishing to, to gain credentials, to do credentials theft, uh, really important is multi-factor authentications, but even that is being bypassed. Okay, 0.1% of MFA user gets bypassed, but then another, and maybe a bigger problem is that only uh, yeah, less than 10% of the accounts of multi-factor enabled. Um, if we look at today, the, the world we're living now with a with a big pandemic, all home users, if these home users are connecting to the organization resources and they are not using multi-factor authentication for their VPN access, that is a huge security risk. And each and every of these organizations, they yeah, sooner or later they will they will get uh, hacked because of this um, what else is a is a problem re in regards to spear phishing or why it's working is mobile devices many people are opening emails on their mobile devices and no i'm i'm not talking about these hacks that exist on android and and, and ios to, to take over the phone yeah that's that's also a problem but the main issue with these mobile devices is that the the presentation of the of the email is limited so the ways for the user to validate on how that email should look like and the user basically doesn't have enough context to decide whether this is a legit email or not and they probably going to click more of these links because of that um, so how can we solve that or at least try to solve that we cannot yeah solve it 100 percent but we at least want to decrease the chance of clicking to uh, under three percent okay and we can do that with some user awareness training then and this is the last slide about this you, you say well yeah okay but it's difficult to uh, to create these kinds of emails for example to do credential stealing no it's not just look now look up on the internet now evil jinx you can download this program if you if you launch it uh, on your on your device and you log on to the tool the only thing you have to say well i want to make a landing page that looks exactly like gmail for example you tell the tool go and copy the landing page of the login page of gmail it will do it um, and you can use yeah, you can create an uh, an internet link that is going to point to this website when the people when people click the link they will go to your fake website which looks exactly the same as a gmail login site they will enter their credentials a login will fail they will say hmm, strange okay probably fat fingering a typo they will try again but when they try again without them knowing they've already been transferred to the real server and the login will succeed um, you see what happened the first time you actually gave your credentials to the attackers and that is a very easy way for them to do uh, credential theft so user awareness um, 
that is a, a very very important point and try to eliminate the initial uh, attack vector and yeah by doing proper uh, email security of course is also uh, very important so i move on to the next um speaker so that is stan vanov he will give you a teaser and yeah he will tell what it's all about Stand. Are you there? Anybody still there? Yeah, just a second. Sorry, I have some, some difficulties. Just give okay. me 10 seconds. Okay, no problem. Let's wait 10 seconds. Okay, sorry for that. If everything's fine now, you should see my, my PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our roadshow. Normally, it was uh, a face to face roadshow, and then we had a little more time. But yeah, due to all the circum, uh, circumstances, we now have uh, uh, make it more compact. So that's why I'm, one of the, the, the things we would present is um, our autonomy of the real life attack. But um, for now, it's, it's just, uh, just a teaser because otherwise we're really going to go on for too long. So next uh, thing we're going to organize is the autonomy. Uh, of a real life attack. And that's based on the report of Fox IT. And uh, the use case is the University of uh, Maastricht. So a lot of you may know uh, that the university was uh, targeted a few, uh, few months ago. It was uh, during December of 2019, um, just during the break, uh, the evening before Christmas Eve, uh, attackers uh, targeted the, uh, the university and they actually encrypted the, the infrastructure at least the most important parts of that infrastructure. Okay, so it was in the news, not only IT news, but also just mainstream media. Okay, it's a, a devastating attack. Um, the already mentioned that they paid a lot of uh, ransomware money. Um, so we're gonna talk about that one. So things we're gonna point out is, is the overview of their infrastructure. Uh, one of the things was they have a lot of different uh, devices over there with different security products also there was a part that was managed by the it team and other part was managed by another team and one of the problems of, of of that kind of infrastructure is they had a lot of unmanaged devices because yeah if you're responsible for some parts and other ones are responsible for another part you got a lot of yeah in betweeners in that case so there was a lack of visibility uh, when you don't have the the good visibility even if you have some good products installed, that's still not enough. You have to make sure that every device is actually uh, visible and being secured. So that was a f the, one of the biggest problems. So how did that attack take place? Well, because of the lack of visibility and, and a lot of different security products, there was also uh, a bad configuration. And when you have users who are, are willing to click on every email, um, that's, that's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, phishing email is still one of the, yeah, the number one vector for attacks. Um, and actually in this case, it wasn't even spear phishing. It was just an easy phishing mail. Uh, but then the attacker uh, had his footprint uh, in, the, uh, in the university and then he went lateral. So the lateral movement uh, is very cool to see how the attacker spread through into an entire network before they encrypted everything because it, it was not clicking on an email and they were encrypted. No, it was clicking on an email and then lateral movement. In a few weeks, he got to the most important places, including backup, uh, it, uh, Active Directory and stuff like that to encrypt everything. So, yeah, the, the sad part is uh, during that inv investigation, they saw actually there were alerts we saw some lateral movement. We saw that there was trying to be uh, the antivirus uninstall and stuff like that. But 
there were too many alerts. And if you have too many alerts, uh, too many log files, and generally uh, stuff like that gets ignored. So what was the impact? Well, I think, yeah, you saw the news. The, the impact was, was massive. I mean, the entire university went down. Uh, it, it was during the holidays, but after those holidays, people have to do their exams and that was not easy to, to start. So the, the uh, created a new crisis cell who has to deal with everything. Um, so the, the impact was, was enormous for the, for the university. Um, systems were uh, completely uh, locked out. Uh, data was, was lost actually because yeah, it was all encrypted and, and even the backup servers were encrypted. They had no uh, offline backup. So they had to choose between yeah, losing a lot of uh, data, research data, and starting from scratch for our entire system. Or yeah, we have to pay because if a large part of your infrastructure is down and you're, you're, you lost critical, critical data for research, then you have to pay. Um, and especially for university, who, who needs to be an, an ethical beacon for, for, for us, it's a, a difficult decision to do because yeah, you have to pay, then you sponsor those attackers and some other university or other company will also be attacked because if you pay, you give them an incentive to keep on going. So it was a difficult questions for them. And then I think most important part is what did we learn from this? And that is for the next time. So uh, this was just a teaser. Next time we go in depth, what, what, what happened and uh, how can, we can uh, make sure that not, doesn't happen again for you. So that was my part. Okay, so thank you, Stan. You're welcome. So yeah, now uh, up next, it's Lars from Fortinet, who's going to be present you the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Okay, um, so uh, Stan and Pete again already talked about uh, the different attack vectors. Uh, Stan gave a small overview about um, the attack on the University of Maastricht. Um, in the attack vectors, we have two frameworks that are used. One of them is the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Um, and we are going to map the, the Fortinet solutions on how we can protect against this uh, kill chain. So going further, as I said, we have two uh, major attack frameworks uh, which are relevant in, in cybersecurity. One of them is the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. The other one is the MITRE attack framework. MITRE is a, a bit more technical. Um, we are not going uh, in depth, but uh, at the end of the presentation, um, there is a link to, to a Fortinet website, which explains the MITRE attack framework and, and also uh, gives an insight on the different exploit techniques that can be used um, to exploit, exploit a system. Most people of you might know Lockheed Martin out of a military perspective. Um, this is the Lockheed Martin F-35 aerial bomber. Um, so they are very known in, in, in military-grade solutions, uh, helicopters, airplanes, and things like that. And it's out of that basis that they, they had a military kill chain. The military kill chain is also some kind of basis for the cyber kill chain. And just to understand in, in military action, it's not just we are going to attack an enemy and we are just doing it like that. There is also a lot of preparation which can be found in a, in a cyber attack um, in, in quite sim similar to a military attack. First, there is uh, find the, the identification of a target. And reconnaissance data is, is very important. Knowing what is going around over there, how many people are there, what is their security posture, and things like that. 
then they are going to fix the target's location and, and obtain specific coordinates because not every target is in the same place always. As Peter Jan already said, for example, via, via RDP, um, you want to know what or which servers are vulnerable or which servers you need to protect. Then they are going to track the movement of the target, um, see what's happening. Is he always staying in the same place? Is he moving around and around? And then they are going to take a decision to engage the target um, or afterwards whether it was successfully engaged or not to do anything to the target at all because he's too well protected. Then they are going to select a weapon to attack the target. Um, it's like hunting an elephant. You don't do it with a handgun, but you use a, a bigger gun as an example. Engage, they are going to apply the weapon on the target. So they are going to attack the target. Um, if you want to hit a tank with somebody in it, you're not going to use an AK-47, but you're going to use, for example, a bazooka or another tank. And then they assess, they evaluate the effects to see whether the attack was successful or not. Within the cyber kill chain, we have seven different steps. Um, in the military kill chain, we only had six different uh, steps. In the first phase, we have the reconnaissance. So the intruder selects a target. He does a lot of research about it and they attempt to identify vulnerabilities in the network. As Peter Gannon Stan specified, most of the vulnerabilities are coming in via, via email or attacked via email, um, but it can be an RDP server, an endpoint of a user, or no matter what in your network that can be targeted. Then they are going to, an attacker is going to weaponize a document, um, is going to insert the malicious content in the document and then deliver that document to a user or via a website, via a drive-by download or malicious JavaScript to um, the network that he wants to attack. Once the user has clicked on it or opened the document, the explo exploitation can start. The malware in the document is triggered and it will exploit the vulnerabilities that are present in the network or on the system and that were find out, found out via the reconnaissance phase. The inst installation of additional malware and backdoors backdoor that can be usable by the intruder and the backdoor will be used to uh, get access or further access to the system. Connection to the command and control center uh, with installation of persistent access. So the APTs, the advanced persistent threats. So the attacker doesn't have to comply every time with a new exploit but can use the pre-installed backdoor and the connection to the command and control center to regain access in an easy way to the system uh, of the victim. And then the actions of an objective, the intruder takes some actions, for example, to encrypt the data, to install a crypto miner on a device, to exfiltrate data or do whatever else. Now, the actions on objective are most of the time the worst part because if it's encryption of data for ransom, this can be very hard to remove uh, or you have to reinstall a backup or you have to pay. But if they were able to install a ransomware or a crypto, or a crypto miner on your device, 
they have the hands on your device and you don't know what else they can still do. If we take it in a timeline in the cyber kill chain, we get the seven steps again. It's are the same, so I'm not going to explain them uh, over and over, but this takes us in a further uh, part of the presentation to the protection on the different steps that we can take or that we can activate. Stan and Pete again already talked a lot about the attack vectors. Um, the most important attack vectors are spam, phishing messages, malicious mails that enter. Um, in 19% of the cases, um, a malicious mail is the basis of an attack and somebody clicking on that malicious mail is starting the attack. The other six, seven percent of the attacks is based using malicious URLs. So just surfing to the internet can launch a malicious JavaScript, can launch uh, something malicious on a website without the, without the user even knowing it. With the two attack vectors being a phishing message or a malicious URL, um, the, the point is to um, install or activate malware, a vulnerable exploit, an advanced persistent threat, or in the worst case, a ransomware on your device. So the two main attack vectors are used to do whatever they want. If we are going to look into the Fortinet solutions, we are not going to talk about point products. Some of them might be point products, but also more in general about the Fortinet solutions. We have the protection against advanced threats. We can protect in reconnaissance phase, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and action on objectives phase. The only phase we as, a secure, we as a security vendor can't protect against is the weaponization phase. Because weaponization is something that is done on the internal side of the organization or of the attackers or, the, or uh, by the attacker. So we don't have control what an attacker is doing on his system, how he is rewriting code, how he is injecting malicious content into documents. But even within the reconnaissance phase um, to protect against advanced threats, we can use, for example, the Fucti Deceptor, which is a product that you install in your network and that is going to launch some decoys, uh, some honeypot systems, looking like your own systems, but just used for triggering alerts in the Fucti Deceptor console. So if somebody is, for doing, uh, is doing, for example, a network scan and they connect to a 40 deceptor decoy, an alert is given and you know that somebody is doing a network scan or a certain port scan on your devices. On the moment of delivery, so even before the exploitation can start, we can protect with 40 sandbox and 40 AI for the artificial intelligence. Then the second stage is the exploitation installation. We also have different products being the sandbox, the AI and the deceptor, um, which can block installation or exploitation phase. And with insight and 40 analyzer, uh, with the information of compromise um, portfolio of the 40 analyzer, we can get insight, we can get visibility on what is going on. In the third stage, um, that is at the moment, um, your system is already targeted, the exploitation has already started, but the connection to the command and control center or the action on objectives are starting at that moment. We can also protect with a 40 sandbox or with the deceptor or some other tools. If you are looking into the network, 
we have our forty gate firewalls, we have other solutions, but the basis of security are the features that are mentioned over there, being the intrusion prevention, web security, to know whether a site is malicious or not, application control, web filtering, anti-spam, anti-botnet, antivirus. As you can see again, nothing can be done on the moment of weaponization, but on all the other phases, we have different pieces inside the different products of Fortinet that can protect against the different phases of an attack. And the earlier we can stop an attack, the better it is for you as a company or as a partner. Because if an intruder doesn't know how to, or doesn't know your environment because he can't, he can't do anything in the reconnaissance phase, he also can't deliver an exploit to which you are vulnerable. He can't deliver a document which might be an attack on your system. He can't exploit your system because he doesn't know what to exploit. And then as last part, we had the network perimeter. Um, we had some other solutions inside the network used as a decoy or something like that. But in last phases, we have the endpoint. And we know that endpoints are vulnerable and all users are using some kind of an endpoint to, con to connect to the network of the company. And in the last phase, we have the actions of, of objectives. Um, in November last year, Fortinet bought 40 EDR or bought the Ensilo product, which is now named as 40 EDR. Even with the action on objectives, as for example, malicious encryption of files, um, exfiltration of data, not in a DLP sentence, but really malicious exfiltration of data without you knowing it, without the user taking any action, can be blocked using 40 EDR. Um, the onnet offnet story with web filtering used out of the 40 client. We can block websites if somebody is working from home as like he would be in the office using the web filtering. And for delivery, exploitation and installation, it's also web filtering, antivirus and endpoint vulnerability. So exploit prevention that can be used to uh, protect your system. Mapping the different solutions um, to the Lockheed Martin kill chain is quite nice. But as we saw over the three slides, it's not just one single point product that can bring you the best of security. And even with all security products used, you will never come to 100% of security. Um, seen in the presentation by Stan and by Pete again, Blue Keep, the attack on the University of Maastricht, uh, RDP that might be open, there's always a small possibility that you are under attack. But to better protect and to better understand, we don't need point products, but we need those point products to work together as a whole. And that is what the secure, Fortinet security fabric is all about. In a central point, we have the next generation firewall, the heart of the internal network and the connection to the external network. We can use network access, we can use secure wireless LAN and LAN functionality, we have endpoint protection, we have security operations, SOC services, um, being analyzer, SIEM, uh, FOGTSOR, we have application control, cloud infrastructure, we have a centralized management, 
to manage different uh, sort gates, for example, to manage different switches, and we have an open fabric ecosystem. And all these products are integrated to redu reduce the complexity of different management platforms and to share intelligence, to share information. And even uh, these different products can work in an automated way together. If we see something malicious happening on an endpoint, it can, for example, communicate via the 40 analyzer towards the 40 gate, and the 40 gate can take actions at that point in time without any human interaction. If you look on the point products, the pillars, we have in the first part network authentication. Should every user be allowed to connect to the network? For those products, for those in, in this investigation, we can use Fortinac, the Forti client, which is also the fabric agent, so the connection to the next generation firewall and authentication services. Connection to secure wireless LAN in LAN using the 40 switch and the 40 AP that can be managed out of the 40 gate, with the 40 gate being the core of the security fabric. Connection to cloud, we see movement evolution to cloud. And as Peter again said in his presentation, is moving or migrating to the cloud being the solution for security? No, not at all. Um, in the past, we've seen open communications to, for example, AWS, AWS S3 buckets, as the user or the company didn't secure the S3 bucket of AWS or uh, the server they get from Azure. In application control, application security, we have the 40 web uh, reverse proxy functionality and um, web server protection, 40 mail protection of email, CASB cloud access security broker, and 40 ADC load balancing to different uh, web servers in a secure way and uh, blocking DDoS attacks and attacks on, on, on websites. For the endpoint protection, we have 40 client and 40 EDR, as said, being the in silo uh, by over by Fortinet, uh, dating from November last year. For intelligence and correlating all this information, we have the 40 analyzer, 40 sandbox for deeper investigation of documents and um, sandbox detonation, 40 SIEM and SOAR uh, solutions. And for management, we can have the 40 manager, 40 gate cloud solution, or 40 cloud so solution for the, the management of the non 40 gate products. And all of most of the solutions are available as an appliance, a virtual machine in the cloud, whether it might be Azure, AWS, GCP, uh, even Alibaba Cloud, we can protect you in these environments. We can uh, provide it in a security as a service model or just as downloadable software. We also understand, it's sometimes a pity, but we understand that not every company is going to buy all the solutions of Fortinet. We can only hope for that. Um, and that you have a legacy install base with some other solutions. The good news about that is that Fortinet with the security fabric has more than 350 security fabric ecosystem integration. It's an open fabric API. So using this API, we can connect with other companies, we can receive information from other solutions, and we can also send information back to those other solutions. But if we receive malicious information from another uh, endpoint solution, for example, we can also integrate this 
in the rest. Uh, for example, when using the Fugty Sandbox, we can send updates to the other Fortinet products to give you a better protection. And this via the extended fabric ecosystem and not being a closed system. If you want more information about the attack chain, and I know this presentation will be made available later on, you can um, click the link to the Fortinet Developer Network, where you can find an overview of the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain, as I've presented to you, and also a, a link to the Martyr Attack Framework, where the more technical part uh, the exploit techniques, the advanced threat protection of Fortinet is explained in a more technical way than Lockheed Martin Kill Chain. This was it for my presentation as an overview on how we can protect using the Lockheed Martin Kill Chain. Now, Peter Jan will go further in a live demo and I hope it's uh, without swearing or cursing and that everything will, root, will run, run uh, smoothly. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Exclusive already gave a presentation about remote connection and SD branch. Now it's more on how to protect a user and to gather user information and intelligence using the security fabric. Okay, thank you, Lars, for your presentation and the introduction. Okay, so first a few slides. Um, and as Lars already said, uh, the slides, they come from what Fortinet calls fast tracks. Okay, so what is a fast track? This is something we uh, organize every few weeks or at least we're planning to um, where technical people can actually get an introduction into how different Fortinet technologies can work together in order to solve a specific uh, problem in this case it's all about the Fortinet teleworker solution so so what is the, the problem here we are seeing the industry challenges um, there is a growing need for remote work solutions Definitely, I think we are all in one of those three uh, right now. Uh, there is a global pandemic, but it can also be natural disasters, act of terrors, uh, whatever, okay, or too less space in the in in, in the office. Um, so people need to be able to work remotely, um, and all kinds of sizes of businesses, large and small, they can be affected. Now, a problem there is at that moment you are um, expanding your attack surface okay to the people's home um so the, the people are, are moving from within the perimeter behind the firewall um to outside of that perimeter and you need to be able to extend that perimeter on that level as well because we are seeing uh, more and more now uh, that the remote workers are targeted and especially the attackers they're using COVID 19 um as a, uh, a means of attacking these uh, these employees by sending out emails with links to corona maps where you can see what cities are the most infections etc etc but not only on these websites statistics are being shown but there is actually malware behind that site so we need to be very careful um, where we see that in belgium the supermarkets they cannot uh, give you promotions anymore well on the black market uh, on the dark web it's different you can buy um, malware specially designed for this covid situation tracker malware with a discount code okay so let's go shopping so some use cases we have um, and and it's not limited to that it, it, it all depends on on, on on every organization but what fortinet has seen is that there are three remote worker types so we have the basic users power users and the super users um, so depending on what user you are uh, and yeah everybody who is doing remote work is seen as a basic user at least um, depending on what user you are that it, it depends on how how you want to gain access so let's let's quickly look at that 
And the idea is when these users get access to the organization resources that we do not lo lose visibility uh, on what they are doing and on the security posture of their devices, because that is the biggest risk. You move or systems from within the pyramid, uh, perimeter to the, to the outside of the perimeter, but you're connecting them again to your vulnerable services or to, uh, to your crown jewels. So you need to keep the visibility in order to be able to keep enforcing that same security. And we're going to be using the Fortinet security fabric for that. Basically, we're expanding to that view of the remote users. Um, so what is a basic user? Um, we all know them. That's a user with a laptop or a mobile device, and they make a VPN connection using a VPN client. In the Fortinet world, in the Fortinet security fabric, we call this the Forti client, okay? And we will see there is different ways of managing these clients, so it can be free, but if you want to have it managed, and that's especially useful for larger organizations, we need the uh, EMS, Forti client EMS for that. Now, very, very important, and it's actually it's with all kinds of authentications, you need to enforce uh, two-factor authentication. If you don't do that and the credentials of the user get stolen, they, yeah, these attackers, they will be able to also make that VPN connection and access the resources that that user is allowed to access um, if you made restrictions on that, of course. Um, so if you have a 40 token or any token solution, basically, uh, but the tokens they from Fortinet, they integrate perfectly in the security fabric. Um, you can avoid that credential theft is going to lead to direct access to the organization's resources. So when we have that, we have full visibility, and I'll do that live. We will see a view similar to this one into the FortiGate. We can identify the teleworker risks and automatically apply security or do it manually, depending on how you want to act. And these actions are here quarantining files, doing auto patching, compliance checks, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have tokens from Fortinet, managed from the FortiGate, managed from a Forti authenticator, or even in the cloud, there's different deployment options <coughs> for that two-factor authentication. They exist in a physical version or even in a mobile version. And then we move on to a few other use cases. Um, a power user, that's a user which, yeah, where uh, just mm, uh, a VPN client isn't sufficient. You really need to have network access to your resources. Maybe you, you want to connect other devices, a printer, a forty phone, or any um, uh, PBX solution. Well, we can use for these uh, power users a forty access point. So you're going to ask yourself a question, what? What with an AP? Well, the AP can be managed from the FortiGate, and if it's connecting um, to that FortiGate, it can be from within the network, but also from the user's uh, home. It will create a secure tunnel, and without any client, you can tunnel through that Forti access points SSID to your organization. If the SSID is the same as the organization's SSID, there will be no difference in how the, the user needs to configure his computer in order to gain access to the company's uh, resources. Of course, the access point you cannot, that you can take it with you to hotels, etc. But it, it's not the ID to do so. So if you're moving out of your your home office, um, you will still rely on that VPN client. And yeah, again, visibility on who's connecting where. And then we have a super user. We need to have more security features enabled um, or more granular control of our uh, flow of traffic. We can yeah, actually, oh, sorry, too fast. We can have a FortiGate or a Forti Wi-Fi, a small uh, FortiGate 30E, for example, given to every employee that needs this kind of, uh, of access. So you see there's different solutions, only, only a client, um, an access point maybe, or a full FortiGate with, with a lot of options for, uh, for the super users. So let's, let's connect now quickly to the, um, the demo environment. I'm going to share uh, my screen. It's running. There it is. 
So if all is right, you are seeing 40 demo developer network. Um, so what do we have here? So this is the this is a topology. Um, it's a large organization. We have an enterprise firewall here. That's the core firewall. We have a few branches. And within the core network, we have critical assets that are the financial servers, the intranet with all of our resources and data, and some Fortinet products to, to support uh, our security fabric. Okay, then we have branches and they're all interconnected with each other. And somewhere there is also a user, which is a home user, and that is going to create a VPN connection. So let's quickly look at the view on the FortiGate. And then I will move on to what visibility we have on these clients. So we have the FortiGate. If we go to the security fabric, um, we can show the physical topology. And depending on the level you have integrated or depending on the level of Fortinet device you have in your organization or third party connections, you will see more in there. We see we have a FortiGate. We have different forty gates. Uh, we have a forty analyzer for logging. We have sandbox integration for advanced threat protection. We have switches of Fortinet access points, clients, and it's all email security, web, uh, and SD one. It's all integrated in this fabric, and that eventually gives you this big view of um, of your organization. So what we see the root forty gate, and then all these branches, which are if we over over here, they're connected. Uh, using a VPN, we see that here, okay? Uh, other systems in the organization on the route are some access points and, and switches, but currently there is nobody connected to that. Um, on the branches, however, we see people connected, like for example, this system, Tami Gerber, uh, other devices, and we see a lot of details. We see that whether they're online or offline, whether it's um, a Linux machine or a Windows machine, we can even search. So if I search on the computer name, it will highlight that computer. And interesting to notice, this computer has a red circle, meaning uh, it's at critical risk. And that is the visibility we are talking about. You want to have that visibility about the clients in your network, but also if they're outside of your network, in making connections to your organization and probably you are not going to want to allow that user from making a vpn tunnel and until these these critical risks are resolved and that are all decisions you can you can take automatically in the fortinet security fabric um, so we see here some details vulnerabilities uh, the, the device name it's registered it's online uh, in what domain it's sitting what user is logged on uh, all of these details we have. So how do we get that information from these clients? Because we have the uh, integration with the enterprise management system, the 40 client enterprise management system, that's the, manage, uh, the system that is managing all of our 40 clients. So with a free client, you can make VPN connections, but you are not going to get this visibility. This is a license, I'm just, telling you so there are no mistakes. Um, so if we log on to the, um, the EMS, we see the, the client status immediately on the dashboard. So there's like 109 vulnerable endpoints. That's not good, but luckily none of them are infected or there are no other special detections we need to we need to. Um, so I click here, we, we will get a list of all of the endpoints um, and whether they're online, yes or no. So for example here, Tami Gerber, if I click there, um, I get the information about why she's seen as, as, as a critical risk. In this case, because there's like all vulnerabilities that have been detected on that, uh, on that device. And these vulnerabilities um, have to do with the, uh, yeah, with the software which is installed and the version which has a, a CVE rating score, which is not good. And that CVE rating score can go from medium to, uh, to high risk. And it's again up to the um, administrator, the security administrator of the organization to decide when you actually want to uh, act on, on, on this yes or no. And we have this information because the Farty client is doing software inventory and it's really you see that all of the software or uh, installed in your organization, you actually can get uh, visibility on that. Okay. 
So, um, when a client is seen as vulnerable, we can uh, configure some stuff in the compliance verification, and then we can tag that client. And here, we're, here we are tagging the clients. Um, for example, we say, well, this is a corporate endpoint. And well, let's, let's see, on, uh, let's check the rules. So how do we decide that? Uh, where are we? Corporate endpoints. So I select this one, I edit it. So, okay, this is managed endpoints, they're corporate, um, based on what rules, because a 40 client is installed and the telemetry is connected to EMS. Uh, for Windows, Mac, and Linux, iOS. So if 40 client is installed and it's all connected, then we see these devices as corporate. That's a possibility here. But you see, we can create tons of rules. We can make decisions on what AD group you're in, whether there is, maybe you have other AV uh, software, no problem. Then we can check on that. We can check on stuff in the registry, certificates being installed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And the same way we can decide that a device is seen as a vulnerable endpoint. We see that here. Okay, when are we seen as a vulnerable endpoint? When there are vulnerable devices with the software inventory uh, with uh, a value uh, of high critical. Uh, high to critical for Linux, Mac, and Windows. So at that moment, we will tag the devices and we can see these tags here. Currently, these are the corporate endpoints and we are detecting three vulnerable devices. So a quick demo now. Um, I have configured on the FortiGate, and yeah, imagine you have no SSL VPN or no VPN at all configured. So what are you going to do? So that the first thing you will do is create in your EMS a endpoint profile. So we go to the local Forti demo profile, and of course you you configure the security stuff like malware protection and sandbox integration if you have it. Um, but then a, a, a question arises. The web filtering I have activated on the Forti gate, that is to avoid users from not being productive, or the tunnel which is going to be created is a full tunnel. So it means all traffic, even for the internet, is going over the VPN tunnel. Maybe we do not want to have the users use high bandwidth utilization because then the one connection is not going to pull it. We can define that in the web filter, which can be activated when you are not behind your parameter or have it activated at all time. It's a decision you can take. Um, the same for application control IPs. And then in this case, the important thing to configure is a VPN. So we have different tunnels that can be defined. And if you look at it, these are basically the settings we, we are using to connect to the, the VPN. If you, yeah, if you run out of bandwidth, maybe for you want to do some load balancing, you can define for different groups of users, different uh, one interfaces. Um, it's very easy to change that on a, on a group level. You apply a different policy and you change the remote gateway. The client will connect to the EMS and get a configuration. So we're going to the client now. The fabric. Yeah, I, that was the password. It's not secret. So here we see the 40 client. It's green, which is good. It's active, um, and it's a it's a security fabric agent because it is connected to the enterprise management server, and it's also connected to the 40 gate. So it's also giving information to the 40 gate, and we've seen that. Uh, we saw the username, etc., uh, etc. Et if we go to um, yeah here for I want to access internal resources um, then 177.102. So if we look at the uh, where is it so that that are actually one of these servers we want to access currently it's not possible because yeah we have no VPN connection we are in our home office so how are we going to do that it's also pinging let's go to the party client remote access. We select a VPN connection, username. Okay. Yeah, 
I did not enable uh, two-factor authentication. Um, it's best practice, you should do it. Um, if that's the case, it will yeah, request uh, additional uh, credentials and that's your two-factor code. Um, I did not do it because it's, it's not, it was not possible in this lab environment uh, at this moment. Well, we are, but I will show you how to configure it. So we see connectivity to that server. If I refresh, okay, there we go. We have access to our uh, organization. The home office is uh, established. All is fine. Now, because this user and in the security fabric is red, we've seen this, Tammy Gerber, she has a critical risk. Um, Probably I don't want her to connect, okay? And uh, I will zoom in later on how it can be automated, but for now I will just say, well, uh, because of what I'm seeing here, I'm going to ban her. It's, it's not a good thing that she's connected now to the organization. Come on, 30, 30 minutes is a little bit. So you can define for how long, permanent, temporary, um, I say 60 seconds now, and also where to apply it. Because Tami, she's not, yeah, uh, yeah. currently she's behind the Forti gate, whatever. She's connecting to that Forti gate. So apply this and we will see, if I refresh this one. Uh, Alder, let's look for her again. Oh yeah, she's disconnected, of course. If we look here, um, there's no ping anymore. The VPN connection is gone. Um, there we go, it's down. That's because we, we guarantee that user. Now, automatically in this case, after 60 seconds, uh, she will be unbanned. Now, of course, I, I imagine you're not sitting behind this console looking for oh, who's red and then doing it uh, manually. No, we have automation for that. So we can go in the Forti gate in the security fabric and we can automate when we are seeing compromised host or anything. So. If you are compromised, if there is malware on you, we can do an IP ban automatically. If we have 40 APs and switches, we can do quarantine on the access layer or even uh, have the 40 client do the quarantine. So these are all things that can be automated. I assume at that moment, you also want to have notifications, which is possible through the 40 Explorer application. That's, that's a push push uh, notification on, on your iPhone or through email. And you can run any CLI script if you wanna do that on the FortiGate um, or send webhooks uh, to a support ticketing system. Let's look at some other configurations we are seeing. So what else can we, uh, can we guarantee? So we explained the use case in the remote, uh, the home office user, but what if, a system in the cloud gets compromised. And these cloud systems are VPN tunnels and they connect to your uh, internal network. You can actually send comments to the cloud, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Ali Cloud, uh, defining what needs to happen when we see that a system is compromised based on the logs we get from these devices. And that can come from the, because there is a Forti gate in the cloud or there is a Forti client installed, all of these logs are stored on the Forti analyzer. And then the analyzer will decide, well, this is a compromised host. We see malicious traffic, we see malicious files in it. Um, and then you can say, well, I, I guarantee it by, by sending a comment to the cloud and, and doing that. So that are all very cool uh, examples on, uh, on that level. Um, so if you would want to enable two-factor authentication, I can show you how easy that is. You go to user and device, user definition. We see that user here, you double click it. You enable two-factor authentication and you select a 40 token. Um, by default, every 40 gate has two 40 tokens. In there, you select it and then, uh, yeah, if, if you go ahead, it will actually ask you to, to give an email address of that user or a mobile device number, and, and it will send the instructions in order to install it. Now, as you can see on the FortiGate, it's limited. It's good for smaller environments. Um, probably in large environments, you would want to um, work with the Forti Authenticator that 
can do token management for you, uh, also in an automated way. It can be connected to Active Directory. If a new user is added, it will automatically uh, take a token, which is in the 40 authenticators pool, and send the instructions to that new user to install it. Okay. So, yeah, basically that, that was it for the for the quick demo. I think uh, the, the, the key takeaways are with the 40 client, we have tons of visibility and that visibility is extended um, into, uh, into our security fabric. We see the physical topology here again. We get all of these details. Then if we go back to the slides very quickly, I'm not going to talk about all of the slides. Um, let me see. But they will be shared. There we go. So this, this is the, the basic setup, but yeah, the idea is to get as much visibility as possible and the slides will talk more about the individual components and what they offer. Like this is what the Forti client is offering, um, the, the tokens, um, do you need an authenticator or, or the mobile token or the, is it sufficient from the cloud? So all, all of the options. Um, very important here to mention, SSL VPN is not a license, okay? IPsec VPN is not a license. The limit of the amount of users we can support depends on the FortiGate model. So every FortiGate, if you have a FortiCare contract, and I hope also a FortiGuard security con services contract, that su uh, will support uh, yeah, VPNs. The EMS, as I said, for the management solution, this will, yeah, this will give you ton, a ton of visibility and more automation um, out of the box. So if you don't have this license, you can install the client, you can make VPN tunnels, but you don't have all of these cool integrations and it's all manual work. EDR, advanced um, uh, endpoint security solution, um, 40 NAC in larger environments, probably you want to have a full-blown uh, network access control solution. Well, we can offer that, and it can all integrate again with the with the uh, with the security fabric. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show really quick. Um, thank you. I'm not sure if there are any questions. I don't see questions. Okay, if there is any question uh, left, just send an email. Um, we will answer to that and. I will now give the presentation to Karen. Um, she will, yeah, wrap up and um, and do a little quiz about so we get your feedback. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Peter, Jan, uh, Stan, and Lars for your contribution to our uh, cybersecurity roadshow. Um,